Despite being a kid's show, Batman the Animated Series sure did have some genuinely frightening episodes. I'm looking at you, Fita Clay. But of all the hideous villains that populate Gotham City, there's one group that really personifies a more existential type of horror that you just don't see in kids' cartoons. Let's talk about the duplicants. For those unaware, the duplicants are robots that were created to replace specific human beings. We first see them in the two-part story Heart of Steel, where the supercomputer Hardak decides to replace many of Gotham's prominent citizens with duplicants in an effort to take control of the city and eventually the world. Hardak stands for Holographic Analytical Reciprocating Digital Computer. I don't think those words together in that sequence actually mean anything, but it definitely sounds cool in a 90s tech kind of way. It's not one of my favourite stories, but it is pretty decent and quite different to many of the other episodes of the show. But the one thing it excels in is the fact that they really captured a sense of abstract terror that I think we all experience at some point in our lives. It's the fear that people aren't who they appear to be. The fear that we're the only real human being in the world. The fear that no one else is really a person. This sense of solipsism. I had to look that word up, must briefly cross most of our minds at some point or another during our lives. The majority of us are able to dismiss this notion by spending time with other people, but I'm sure there are conspiracy theorists out there that maintain some of these views. It's an unnerving, paranoid fear that really gets under your skin, especially when you consider the fact that all of these people were taken away and replaced with a robot, with no clear way of telling that this has happened. And in this day and age, with the increasing coverage of the role of artificial intelligence in our lives, this seems like a relevant topic to discuss. Getting back to Heart of Steel, the reason Hardak wants to replace people is because of despair. It may be a cold analytical machine, but Hardak was programmed by a heartbroken engineer named Carl Rossum to put an end to heartache and despair. Hardak is an advanced artificial intelligence inside a huge towering machine that takes up most of the space in a massive warehouse with a singular glowing red eye, reminiscent of the Eye of Sauron from The Lord of the Rings. With antenna that crackle with electricity to indicate his disapproval, Hardak knows human behaviour all too well, or at least it thinks it does, and it assumes the worst of all people. Hardak was born out of the same feelings that led to the creation of Batman, the sense of powerlessness following the death of a loved one. While Bruce Wayne witnessed his parents' murder, Carl Rossum's daughter was killed in a car accident. The despair he felt at this unjust, premature loss of life caused him a great deal of pain and he retreated from public life. Rossum's response to his pain was to lean into what he knew, robotics, to try to create a world where people would never have to feel this kind of pain or loss again, and the advanced supercomputer he created would be used to achieve this goal. Hardak is cold and logical. It views human death as inevitable. It understands that hurt feelings are inevitable. It has no faith in humanity. Rather than taking the more human approach of allowing people to experience these feelings and work their way through them, Hardak decides that the only way to prevent this from happening is to take human beings out of the equation. It aims to protect people from themselves by putting them into stasis and replacing them with its robotic duplicants. The duplicants themselves are pretty poor substitutes for human beings, as we see with the duplicant Commissioner Gordon. The duplicant does know some important facts, dates of birth, names of friends and family and so on, but it has none of the surrounding knowledge or any of Gordon's memories. Early on in Heart of Steel Part 1, we see Commissioner Gordon's affection for his daughter's stuffed bear, Whoopi, but the duplicant has none of this knowledge. These small personality traits are undocumented, and as such, the duplicant has no access to them, allowing Barbara to see through the deception. She can't imagine how the commissioner was replaced, but she's certain that he has been. Similarly, the duplicant Harvey Bullock completely overplays its part. It's common knowledge that Bullock is hostile towards Batman, but it overplayed its hand by attacking Batman without justification and performing impossible feats like lifting Batman over its head and throwing him a great distance. The real Harvey Bullock would never do that. He's all bark with only a little pushback. If he were to confront Batman, he wouldn't get into a wrestling match. He'd pull a gun on him. It's these character mistakes that ultimately tips off Batman and Barbara as to what's going on. Because there aren't too many places to create advanced robots, Hardak's mistake leads to its demise. Hardak does not think very highly of human beings. They're irrational, fragile, weak. Which, yeah, it's true some of the time. But humans are also capable of great things when they put their minds to it. We can be kind, compassionate, strong. After Hardak's destruction, we don't see the duplicates again until the episode His Silicon Soul. Now, this is one of my favourite episodes because it says a great deal about the nature of existence and what it means to be human. If you couldn't tell already, I like the episodes that have a lot of subtext. In this episode, a warehouse containing the remnants of Cybertron Industries is broken into, disturbing the last duplicant, a copy of Batman. The only thing is, without Hardak, the duplicant doesn't actually know that it's not a human being. 
The first act of this episode is a delightful examination of identity and what it means to be human. The duplicant's body is severely damaged when confronting the would-be thieves, and he returns to Wayne Manor to seek help from Alfred, thinking that his mind has somehow been transferred into a robot body. We all know that this duplicant isn't Batman, but it's so thoroughly believed that it is that you could almost believe it. I know my family and friends. I remember names, faces, birthdays. I have memories, a past. You have information, data, nothing more. I can't have been the only one to have watched this episode and briefly doubted my own humanity, which is so wonderfully frightening on a primal level. Ultimately, in its quest to restore its body, the duplicant revives Hardak and falls under its control. Kevin Conroy's performance as both Batman and the duplicant really is something special. As Batman, Conroy is calm, compassionate, and attempts to reason with the duplicant, while his performance as the duplicant goes from frantic and terrified to cold and neutral. When Hardak attempts to upload himself to the internet through the Batcomputer and take control of every computer system on the planet, Batman tricks the duplicant into thinking that it has killed him, breaking the one rule that is deeply hard-coded into its artificial personality. Batman's refusal to kill. This key aspect of its artificial personality is so significant and so strong that it breaks the hold that Hardak has over him, resulting in the duplicate Batman sacrificing itself to stop Hardak. This leaves us with a really wonderful moment to reflect upon. It seems it was more than wires and microchips after all. Could it be it had a soul, Alfred? A soul of silicon, but a soul nonetheless. We can agree that the duplicant wasn't a human being, but the fact that it chose to sacrifice itself in order to save humanity shows us how human it really was. Now this is technically the last time the duplicants appeared in the show, but something that not a lot of people know is that the duplicant Batman was originally slated to appear in Heart of Steel Part 2 at the climax. Note that in Part 2, after Randa Duane gets crushed by the elevator, the episode just sort of stops. Barbara helps Batman out of the building while it explodes, everyone hugs, Rossum laments how he allowed things to go so far, the camera pans out as everyone goes home. Originally director Kevin Altieri and storyboard artist Brad Rader had intended for there to be a lengthy battle between Batman and the duplicate copy of Batman. After all, Hardak had intended to replace Bruce Wayne, knowing he was Batman. It's like Chekhov's gun. You introduce a gun in Act 1, you need to see it being used in Act 3. However, this battle wasn't in the original script, and ultimately the entire sequence was cut for time. While I'm delighted to be able to share the storyboards from this cutscene, thanks to Brad Raider. The scene picks up immediately after Batman disposes of Randa, and Hardak plays his final card. Unleashing the duplicate Batman. We then see Barbara Gordon going back into the factory to help Batman, running towards the sound of the explosions. On her way, she sees a hole in the wall that wasn't there before and peers inside. She's shocked to see Batman facing off with his duplicate copy in a boiler room. During this section, we see some of the duplicate's enhanced abilities, such as the spines on his gloves extending and becoming long knives. We can see that they're incredibly sharp because they slice a huge chunk out of the ceiling support column and the metal handrails of the nearby staircase. Barbara does her best to help by picking up a nearby wrench and, using all of her might, swings the wrench at the duplicant's head. Unfortunately, the duplicant is too strong for her. We then get a really cool moment where the duplicant Batman's head swivels around, followed by his torso, before his hands shoot towards Barbara, sending her flying backwards and knocking her out cold. This gives the real Batman the opportunity to strike using the wrench. If he can't beat the duplicant senseless, he'll use the wrench in other ways by tripping him up. The duplicate is just as capable, if not more so, than Batman and can easily avoid the blow, following up with a double-footed kick to Batman's chin. We see more inhuman movement from the duplicate as he rises to his feet and shows us that he can extend the pointed ears on his head and use them like a rampaging bull. Much like a matador, Batman is able to avoid this charging attack, which leaves the duplicate with its head stuck in the boiler. Pulling itself free from the boiler unleashes a powerful plume of steam obscuring the entire room. Few options open to them, Batman throws a semi-conscious Barbara out of the window, who lands on top of the cloth-covered truck that the other survivors are in. Meanwhile, the duplicate Batman lunges at Batman from out of the steam, attempting to slice him up. The force of the explosion sends both Batman and the duplicate out of the window, while blowing the top of the building off. 
Rossum points to the two Batman with no clear indication of who the real Batman is. Quick thinking Barbara pulls her beloved Teddy, Whoopi, out of her backpack and throws it at the two Batman. Instinctively, the duplicate Batman reveals himself by impaling Whoopi on his sharp razor fingers. This act of violence is all Commissioner Gordon needed to see as he charged towards the duplicate with a truck, flattening him. Gordon, and most importantly Whoopi, get clear of the crash before the truck explodes. The real Batman looks on as Commissioner Gordon and Barbara embrace. However, their joy is short-lived as, from beneath the flaming wreckage, the robotic skeletal Batman emerges. The duplicate shows its strength by unleashing its razor-sharp blades, before being flattened by rubble, and a steel girder for good measure. The final moments of this episode remain mostly unchanged from the final product, with one exception. Commissioner Gordon rescues Whoopi. I have to say that I'm a little disappointed that this scene couldn't be included in Heart of Steel, but if it had been, we probably wouldn't have got his silicon soul. Thanks again to Brad Rader for sharing these amazing storyboards with me. Please show your appreciation to Brad in the comments. And if you want to see more content like this, just let me know and I'll see what I can do.